Last weekend, as a nation, we celebrated the coronation of King Charles III and Queen Camilla. On Saturday, the service, as you know, was held in Westminster Abbey. And as you know, it was my immense privilege to be one of the two bishops assistant to the king. On Sunday, there was the big lunch, and on Monday, the big help out, in which across the nation, about seven and a half million volunteers took part in registered events. That actually means the number was much bigger because a lot of places people didn't even register their events. The overall focus of the weekend was community and service. Now, there were many moments that stood out for me during the ceremony and had done so through the rehearsals in the days beforehand. There was the divesting of the king's grand robes and tunic so that in the simplicity of an open shirt, he presented himself to God privately as he was anointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And there was soon after that the reclothing in a very simple linen garment, followed by one rather less simple, because it was made entirely of gold thread, and a stole was placed on him by the Prince of Wales, a symbol of his God-given responsibility for the nation. The king was constantly reminded that his calling is to serve the nation and to serve for the good of the people, not for his own aggrandizement. He was regularly reminded that he could only do this with God's help by the Holy Spirit and through the wisdom of the Scriptures. Now, of course, all this was done amongst much pomp, astonishing music, and very careful planning, all of which potentially hides the core point. Our king is called to serve and have a particular care for the most vulnerable. Um, perhaps one, one of the bits that I, I wish was m uh, made a bit more publicly was as all those bits of regalia were being given, the Archbishop of Canterbury had words which were sotto voce, as it said, because you were all listening to Zadok the priest. Actually, most of those words were about serving the most vulnerable and about justice and mercy. Our calling in Christ is the same. Let the same mind be in you, Paul writes to the Philippians, that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It is this commitment to serve the vulnerable that leads us into supporting asylum seekers and refugees. The Old Testament law was very clear about welcoming the stranger alongside caring for widows and orphans. The underlying core of why I, along with Archbishop Justin, spoke out against the provisions of the Illegal Migration Bill this week is that we believe that it fails to properly protect the vulnerable stranger. We all want to see the boats stop and indeed other dangerous ways of traveling here. Actually, it is the success of stopping people traveling on lorries and trains that has led to the development of the small boat route. So we were successful in stopping one, two routes. We now got to be successful in stopping another. Now I had an email, I actually had more than one, but I'm gonna quote you one, from someone who was clearly upset with me. They weren't from this diocese. They wrote, 
I am extremely saddened to hear our church leaders making political points, for inevitably that means that they can no longer claim to lead an inclusive church, with some members and some non-members feeling alienated by the position taken. End of quote. My problem with this is that to not speak out is also making a political point and would leave others feeling alienated because of the silence. Judgment calls have to be made on when to speak and when to keep silent. It's others who make decisions on when they will paste us speaking out on the front of page of newspapers and the leading columns of their newspapers, and when they will quietly pretend that we've said nothing, for example, about poverty. Primarily, I want to simply go on encouraging our churches and individuals to welcome the stranger, provide for them in their need, support them in their desire for justice and mercy. It was a delight on Thursday evening in Stainedrop when I was confirming people from across Barnard Castle to meet a couple from Ukraine who had arrived just three days before and the welcome that they wanted to tell me that they'd been given by the people of Middleton in Teesdale and the churches in their first three days, they just wanted to extol it. Yes, when people are found not to be true asylum seekers, then they should be returned home. I think I should sometimes put that in very big bold because apparently I just believe that we should take everybody. But still, nearly three quarters of those who come when they finally have their case assessed are found to be genuinely in need of asylum. We should not close our doors to such people. Effectively, this is what the bill will do. So I will continue to work to see it improved. Together, I hope that through community sponsorship, welcoming those who come through the only safe routes, which are from Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Hong Kong, and the minimal wider resettlement scheme, currently only available to people from Afghanistan, and working with other organizations, we will go on supporting the asylum seekers and refugees in our communities. Which leads me to reflect a bit more on supporting our communities. One regular critique of what I've just said about asylum seekers and refugees on Twitter is that we should be concerned about the vulnerable in our own communities. As if this is an either or. It is not. Both can be done. We absolutely are committed to our local communities. We serve them through pastoral care, visiting, running food banks, places of welcome, warm spaces, lunch clubs, toddler groups, children's groups, messy churches, working with the homeless, prisons work, hospital visiting, running our schools, and you can go on adding other ways that you know from your own settings. This new book has been published this past week. It's called Dragged Up Proper, Growing Up in Britain's Forgotten North. It's written by Pip Fallow. It's his first ever book. He left school unable to read or write. On the Unheard website, there is an article by Pip about the book. It exposes the continuing plight of many of our communities, notably for him, the villages of the former East Durham mines and coalfields. It is our continuing commitment to serve these communities and the many others like them across the diocese, which has led us to develop the communities of hope, one of which is in one one of the communities in which he lived. I think this is going to be, I've only managed to read a little bit so far, but I think it's going to become a compulsory reading for every new curate, at least, about living, being in Durham. Now, we want to work further from what's happened in the Communities of Hope on how we transform the whole diocese in the coming years so that we are better equipped to serve all our communities well. 
We recently had the good news that the first stage of our diocesan transformation fund application has been successful. We'll hear more from Duncan this afternoon. So we can begin to work on placing chaplains into the colleges of further education and sixth form colleges, which Catherine was talking about earlier. We can develop church plants that will reach new people in fresh ways who would never respond to many of our current ways of working. We can develop our first three mission hubs, where interim ministry is the best way to help parishes reimagine how best to serve their communities in mission and evangelism, then we will be able to do so. It also gives us the encouragement to work further on the next stage of the application, which we hope to submit in the autumn. We all have to, have our, to open our eyes and our hearts to those around us who need the hope that Jesus brings. Those who need to know that they are deeply loved and valued by God, that they matter and have purpose. If we are to keep being and bringing good news, then we have to allow God to transform us more into the likeness of Jesus. This is bound to include some painful pruning of us so that we can be more fruitful. This transformation must include a much greater priority for our work with families, children, and young people in our parishes and through our schools. You'd think we planned this, but I didn't know that Sharon was going to put this on the... So I commend the Love Matters report published at the end of last month. It was my privilege to co-chair the Archbishop's Commission on Families and Households. And this is our report, which highlights that families matter, loving relationships matter, and love matters. One of our key recommendations is that in parishes and chaplaincies, we give much more attention to helping people develop loving relationships throughout their lives. This includes supporting people through difficult periods in relationships. We should be the first port of call for families developing their parenting skills couples exploring a lifelong journey together, and support when things start to go wrong. One of the sadder bits of our research is that at present, churches are not seen as a place to go when things are starting to go wrong, because we will judge them rather than support them. And that's one of the things we need to address. If we focus more on supporting families in all their diversity, we will be supporting the well-being of our communities. This leads me to a brief comment on the ongoing work on living in love and faith. I am immensely grateful to everyone who has written to me expressing their concerns, their longings, and their questions about this work. At present, there are three national working groups looking further at the proposed prayers of love and faith, the pastoral guidance that is needed, and the pastoral reassurance required for clergy and PCCs. This coming week, the House of Bishops will be working further with these themes. The College of Bishops will meet in June. Some outcomes will be presented to the General Synod in July. However, people of all views recognize that it is not possible to do the work required to bring finished proposals in July. So General Synod will meet in November to consider the fuller work. For now, this simply means that the position is that of no change whatsoever. Thus, I am deeply grateful for the patience being shown by all in prayerfully waiting and helpfully contributing ongoing questions hopes, and concerns. Bishop Sarah and I have promised to meet with those who would like to do so again once there are new materials to talk about. You will understand we will have to arrange this once we know when this will be. Please keep holding all of this in your prayers. 
In drawing this address to a close, I want to, in take, uh, to encourage everyone to use the coming period from Ascension to Pentecost for prayer. Thy kingdom come have again produced excellent materials to help us all in our prayers. And personally, I, along with Chris as chaplain and Rosemary, will be prayer walking around Wearmouth Deanery from next Thursday, Ascension Day, to next Sunday. I also want to take this opportunity on behalf of the Synod and Diocese to thank Paul Rickard for his years of service for us leading the joint education team as Director of Education. Paul's leadership has been visionary. The number of children in our schools has grown. Our influence in the wider life of education across the region has been strengthened and we are in a good place for the future, as you saw demonstrated by Jill this morning. Paul is not being lost to us as he becomes the full-time chief executive of the Durham and Newcastle Diocese Multi-Academy Trust. So thank you, Paul, in absentia, for all you have given us as director. Our schools continue to be places where worship takes place, learning about Christ happens, prayer is encouraged, and high-quality education takes place. Our commitment to our schools is one of the key ways that we work out our priority to engage with children, young people, and young adults. We need to keep working at strengthening this. One key way, I believe, is the development of strong chaplaincy work in all our schools and beyond into colleges of further education, sixth forms, and the many other schools who value partnership with us. Yet, engaging with children, young people, and young adults in schools and colleges does not meet them in all parts of their lives. Hence, why we need to work with the whole family, supporting parents and grandparents to be the best they can be for their children. It's why we need to keep looking at ways we can offer support to children and young people through clubs, uniformed organisations, low-level mental health support and other means. Above all, we must never lose our longing that children and young people hear the good news of Jesus Christ. They need to have the opportunity to hear the story, respond to Jesus themselves, and be nurtured in faith as disciples. We need to listen to their voice on challenging poverty, caring for God's creation, and on what real growth in Christ looks like. We need to invest in our children and young people now. Take a look at your own PCC budget and see how much money is put into this. Do an audit of the use of people's time and skills to see how much is being given to working with children, young people, and young adults. As I look back over my years as your bishop, I find myself wishing that I had not only sought to keep this priority at the forefront of our thinking, but set a better example of giving the time to it. As we move ahead with diocesan transformation, we must ensure that all our work on planting, hubs, and being missionary disciples includes children and young people at every stage. That may well mean giving some things up so that the volunteer time and energy can be given to working with children and young people. Older people, which is most of you, do not hear this as, be, as you being forgotten or ignored. You will not be. But for the sake of your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, please recognise why a clear focus on them and their families, which includes you, is required. Jesus called a child whom he put among the disciples and said, Truly I tell you, Unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me.